Welcome back to Let's Have It Out. I'm Oliver Dixon. My guests on the show are Tanti Pai and Kenton Pele. But before that, let's take a call. On the line, we have Clifford from Cape Town. Clifford, how are you doing? Good evening, sir. How are you? Fantastic. Jump right into it, Clifford. Okay. Um, I'm for Tax Revolt um, because the reason is it's actually 50 50. I don't have an issue to alleviate the poverty in the poor. I understand it 100%. But we need to understand where the funds go. If we have a situation where we have a government that are corrupt and we, uh, we as the tax, taxpayers must take out that, that money, that is where the issue comes in. But to uh, uplift the, uh, the poor and to, 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 to help the needy, I don't have an issue with that. Clifford, you guys had a, a, a relentless fire in Cape Town over the last couple of days. Uh, the fire was fought off, obviously, by, by state employees, uh, firemen and emergency staff. How do you think they would have been paid in a tax revolt? Well, that's a different situation because we are speaking here about a government that is corrupt, first of all. I'm not saying all uh, government officials are corrupt, but we need to have a system. We need to implement systems to can say that, listen, we, we, we can account for the money. Where does the money go to? That is the question, yeah. So I'm for a, a tax revolt, um, but for, to uplift the, the, the poor and the, yeah. and, 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 and the communities, I'm also for that. Thank you for your engagement over there, Clifford. I want to go, let's speak about corruption for a second. Um, firstly, there's no state in the world that's not corrupt or doesn't have some traces of corruption. I think uh, we can all concede to that. Uh, you know, Trevor Noah speaks, speaks of functional corruption, and, and I guess that's where we're trying to get. But you need to at least convince me, Kenton, that uh, a tax revolt will either bankrupt the state enough for it not to be able to be corrupt, in which case poor people die, or that a tax revolt will change the attitude of the ruling party in government. You see, the question at this moment really isn't whether it's going to bankrupt the state. The question is whether, as taxpayers, the way in which we spend our money would be better spent by giving it directly to people who are the potential so, recipients. So, uh, describe as, that. As, as an example. So, there, there's a classic case of um, villages in Mexico which seven years ago, uh, as of last year, they tossed out their government. So essentially the people of the town got together, they got into a revolt, they tossed out the government. They literally told the elected officials of all parties to leave town. They tossed out all of the drug cartels. For the next period, while the government kept trying to impose its will again on the people, every evening the people got together and they had a traditional meeting where they elected a council of elders. That council of elders would meet every night for the next 30 days until they had actually stabilized enough systems in that town. And to this day, they pay no taxes. Everything that they collect is dispersed by uh, collective. I mean, yeah. in, in, and, and essentially what I'm trying to say is that if you look in terms of money that is meant to go into our rural areas, if you take the Eastern Cape as a case in point, money that is meant to actually filter into the hands of those communities actually never gets there. There are 24,000 pit toilets in schools right now which the government is, uh, is unable to fix. If you had just simply taken the money meant for that, the minister now says you need 10 billion in order to fix it. If you had taken that 10 billion and dispersed it directly yeah. to those communities, they but would have been able to do it. You're but speaking of a remote community. We're speaking of a country with a population of 57 billion civilians. Uh, you know, this is possible if you're a, a community of what, uh, five, 10,000 people, we can all meet up every night and have a meeting about what our agenda for the next month will be. But it's not possible when you're a state of 57 billion. But even when you do that, you're configuring a state. You're configuring a system through which you will finance that system, and that is a tech uh, regime. Well, effectively, we already do that to some extent, because if you consider that a significant chunk of us pay for private security, a significant chunk of us pay for private education, a significant chunk of us um, uh, pay for private health care, and all of those things are meant to be provided by the state through tax funds, but people are already paying for it at another <coughs> level. But uh, let's just focus instead, if we avoid corruption for a second, we also need to consider the fact that our government doesn't actually understand how to spend money. 
And I'll give you a very specific no, no, be, example. Be, be, before you do, I think you're conflating purchasing a service versus, uh, uh, you know, respecting your social contract that you made towards the state, for instance. But, Clanty, for instance, uh, government has a responsibility to protect me using the police. Whether or not I choose to purchase the services of private security, surely that's still good enough a reason to continue paying taxes, even if yeah. I can't afford to send my child to Rodine, for instance. And I think that makes us a, a very interesting um, question. Remember, what uh, is being called for his, what is relatively called sanctions. So, for example, many states who were opposed to South Africa's regime decided not to do business with South Africa, to try and bankrupt the South African government in order to try and make sure that they change. It's what they were trying to do in Zimbabwe, for example, with sanctions, is to say, we are not going to give you support, we're not going to give you foreign currency and all of these things. Sanctions because, are the poor. Yes, the but as we all know, that sanctions actually get the poor the most, right? The Zimbabwean government, the rich of the, the you know, President Mugabe and all the people around him continued to live their lives and the, what it left was an economic wasteland that affected the poor who had to run away from that situation and all the ministers and all the government people continued to buy themselves expensive cars, yeah. take private jets. So we know that actually sanctions are demonstrably ineffective in these kinds of things. So it is not useful actually. You bankrupt and you hurt the most vulnerable, the ones you would say you are trying to protect if you put in sanctions. Um, and as we also know, that government spending is a, very, is a big part of actually our economic activity as a country, which means it's part of our employment, in yeah. terms of the people spending in our shops, people who are actually paying salary, all of these things. So actually, the people we're going to hurt are not going to be the government officials who are corrupt, as we say they are, but the poor people. So how do we find different methods in which we actually deal with this, as we have to find different methods in how we actually punish the government? Let's pay some bills, but when we come back, Anthony, I want to put it I want to put a question to you. Would you suggest that we continue to live in our democratic dispensation where we vote for a government uh, each five years and whether or not uh, each time that government becomes corrupt by any margin, we start withholding our taxes? But let's pay some bills. We take some more of your calls and comments after the break. The hashtag is LHIO if you would like to engage in social media.